Okay, so um, everyone's back here. So everyone should have like a pretty uh, large amount of crashes at this point. Does everyone have more than 10 crashes? All my VB cats will have more than 10 crashes. Hold on one sec, it's not recording yet. Oh, I'm sorry, never mind, it is. Looking at the wrong screen. And the answer is yes. So everyone on VBcast, 10 crashes? Okay. So we have this large body of crashes. I'm sure some of you have been curious and have looked at the uh, crash log file right now. And so, you know, we have all these crashes and it's not really sure whether or not they're exploitable. Some of them are not and some of them are probably. So let's go ahead and start talking about the science of um, trying to determine whether or not crashes are exploitable. So one thing that you can do um, right away is if you have a crash, it's uh, worthwhile to reproduce it in the debugger so you can look at things um, closer. And I, before I start talking about doing this manually, I just want to show you a WinDebug extension which tries to do it automatically. So you can reproduce one of your crashes in WinDebug by running Here I'm just telling WinDebug to start CDF Reader with one of my crash documents that my fuzzer recorded. Who did that in the bugger? I got a different but similar crash. Yeah, actually, guys, um, I just realized something. So, actually, switch to the directory. Where the CDF reader executable is located. And the reason is, uh, this is one thing I should have done a little better, there's this font file in, the, in that directory, consola.ttf, and it's using this to sort of render some of the text. And if that .ttf file is not in the same directory as CDF Reader, CDF Reader is going to crash because it's going to try to load that font file and it's not going to exist. So you can move this around, but whatever directory you launch CDF Reader from has to have that has to have that .ttf file in. Otherwise, it's going to crash. Okay. Do you want to the .ttf file? Uh, you could, yeah. But you would be looking for bugs and you know Microsoft stuff at that one point. Because it's actually like Microsoft code that's uh, using the TTF. Um, actually, I changed it back. It's a uh, simple direct media code that's uh, using the TTF one. So you can fuzz that TTF file and find any bugs in it. It probably uh, represents an underlying vulnerability in the simple direct media layer graphics rendering library, which would be a pretty interesting bug. So yeah, feel free to do that. So you Okay, so I'm just going to run it in a windy bug. Reproduce one of my crashes. Do a G, just let it continue till the crash. Bug is uh, having a panic attack about something. Not really sure what. Let's try again. Oh, it's because I haven't fixed my uh, my path in this. Forgot that I'm using a new fresh VM right now. Okay, so um, 
With this scratch I have on my screen right now, I'll change the font for you guys. Um, just out of curiosity, who thinks this one's exploitable? All right, so Ford does not think so. And uh, why is that? What's your reasoning behind that? Well, it, for me, right, it, it, it's a move from, uh, it's a read from whatever ECX is pointing at, the EAX. So yeah, but the instruction itself doesn't matter. matter. It's the fact that it's at EIP 68125930, right? We've actually changed EIP. We may have changed EIP to oh. some crazy instruction, but unless that's the memory space where CDF Maybe, is, then like we seem like we control. So, what's, what's so the you, can, you can see, you can see that this is a memory space for the simple direct media layer DLL. So we crash in the simple direct media layer DLL. And what is the nature of the crash? Can anyone tell me? What's a null pointer? No pointer dereference. You can tell that it's trying to dereference ECX. ECX is zero. So, usually when I'm looking at these crashes, I try to imagine best case scenario. Let's just, right now it looks like no pointer dereference, which generally is not exploitable. Um, sometimes in the right conditions it can be, but in this case probably not. But let's just assume that since ECX is the bad value here, that the attacker completely controls ECX. Right, it's somehow the attacker can completely control that value. Um, even assuming that, would this be exploitable, just based on what you can see there? Not unless he controls the AX too. Not really, so if he controls ECX, then he could potentially control EAX, all right, being optimistic. Then there's some bitwise arithmetic. And it writes EAX to this value, so it's probably you know doing some bitwise arithmetic on a local variable and writing it back. And um, not real excited about that. Probably not exploitable. Sometimes the C++ class stuff, you'll see like move EAX, ECX, and I'll be like no pointer reference, which doesn't look exciting. But then right afterwards, you'll see like call EAX, in which case it would be exploitable. But in this case. Probably not. And in fact, we can use a WYDEBUG uh, extension to try to automatic, automatically tell us if it is. If you do dot load msec, or like Microsoft Security, I believe, is what they're going for there. And then do bang exploitable. Uh, Microsoft wrote this WYDEBUG extension which tends to automatically determine or classify the exploitability of a crash. So you guys are free to use this on um, the crashes you got and sort of compare it to your own intuition. So this is saying um, unknown, being exploitable doesn't know if this is exploitable or not. So the three states it can give you are ex probably exploitable, uh, like probably not exploitable, and unknown, and it just has some heuristics that it uses to attempt to determine that. And uh, unfortunately, the heuristics aren't very good. Like I believe it only looks at the the, ver the very next line that it crashed, like right in the general vicinity where it crashed, and applies some pretty uh, harsh, not very fine gained heuristics. Like it'll say if the next line is a call, it's automatically exploitable. Kind of stupid stuff like that. And it just applies a bunch of heuristics to like the line that it crashed on in the very next line and try to determine if it's exploitable or not. So it's not really a great tool as a security researcher. I believe it's designed more for like their software engineers to try to triage and prioritize which things and which bugs to try to look at first. Because if it says it's exploitable, um, the probability that it is exploitable is higher, you know, and if it says it's not exploitable, it's probably lower. But um, unfortunately, Bang exploitable can be wrong a lot of the times. It can give you false positives, false negatives, and it will also give you this uh, unknown a lot as well. But it's something you can use at least when you're analyzing your crashes. So that's one way to look at the crashes in WYDEBUG. Let's just look at our crash log output. Okay, so the first one is kind of like what we just looked at. 
null pointer dereference. Here's this crash too, another null pointer dereference. You can tell that PyDebug is um, automatically is just dumping out a bunch of program state whenever it logs one of these crashes, which is pretty handy. Like the state of the registers, what instruction it crashed on, um, the disassembly of brownware it crashed, and it'll also tell you the state of the stack, I believe, further down here, and the exception handlers, which is also useful in case you happen to overwrite an exception handler. So let's come down here to the next crash. Um, what do you guys think about this one? The stack overflow. So we see rep move SD. Uh, what function is that synonymous for? Memcopy. Memcopy. Rep move SD is a synonym for memcopy, essentially. Okay. So knowing that this is mem copy, can you tell me what the arguments were approximately? What registers does rep move SD use in its operation? ESI and EDI. There's another one too. And ECX. ECX. So where was it trying to write from and where was it trying to write to? The source index was 385CE2. The destination index was 1300, so it probably crashed because it was trying to write off the end of the stack. Uh, ECX, it was trying to write a huge amount of data. Um, do we think that this is exploitable? One question you should be asking yourself is, does the attacker control the data that was overflowing the stack? It seems that way because the ESI is passing out a bunch of FE, 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 unless that's like uninitialized data. Your uh, microphone is like super messed up and echoey, you know, stuff like that. The voice of the Illuminati. So um, this is probably exploitable, but there's one thing I'm not real kind of not excited about, and that's the fact that uh, the source data is all these E's and FE's, E's and FE's. Does anyone know what this is? This is kind of like a signifier that the Windows operating system usually uses for like uninitialized data. Okay. So whenever you see that, it often means like uninitialized memory, uninitialized heap, stuff like that. So it's not immediately clear whether or not we control the data that is smashing the stack. So I'll sort of remember this one and come back to it. Um, and kind of keep it in my pocket because I'm hoping that I'll, I find something better. But if I don't, I'll come back to this one and, and try to look at it. Just trying to triage which bugs I want to spend my time on. So we can see right here the exception handlers were uh, overwritten with that sort of uninitialized data, so that's good. But whether or not we control these is hard to tell. What would be one? Actually, I want. Uh, okay, uh, how about this one? It's a null pointer dereference. So be generous again and assume the attacker controls completely controls EDX, assuming that. Let's um, look at the disassembly. So this is the line that we crashed on right here, actually. And assuming we completely control EDX, you can sort of assume we completely control ECX. So it looks like we could control ESI. And then it looks like ESI is just determining whether or not a jump occurs. So it's probably just checking like a flag zero or one kind of deal. So not real interesting. That would be my thoughts.
Okay, another null pointer dereference. We've already seen this one. Remember, we're seeing a lot of the same repeated crashes. So you always see that fuzzing. Same crashes over and over again. And developing heuristics to uniqueify your crashes is always one of the harder parts of fuzzing. Okay, another rep move SD. Let's see what we think about this one. Uh, looks like it's kind of the same though. Source index is um, E's and FE's and the same sort of address. So looks like we've already seen this one before. I'll skip past it. Um, I saw that one. You saw this one? Yeah. What do you guys think? So ESI in this case is this, which is not null. So once again, assume that the attacker completely controls it. Kind of hard to tell. Um, so I'm going to show you guys some crashes in some other applications, just to uh, give you a better feel for um, this sort of crash analysis. And I'll want you to do it on your own for a little bit. So um, let me find one first that I think is uh, actually. I'll show you. Okay, uh, this one you guys already saw. Okay, here's one. You guys think this is exploitable or not exploitable? It's slide 194 for anyone that can't read this in a DB cache. I like those dead beeps. Yeah. It's Whenever you see like EIP equals dead beep or X exception chain equals dead beep, that's usually a pretty good sign. Unless you know that Microsoft or whatever operating system is using that as a default uninitialized value, but in this case it was like something that was in my payload. So whenever you see like attacker controlled data written all over the stack during a crash, probably exploitable. Gee, this looks like yesterday's. All right, how about this one? What can you tell from this crash gun? Well, you control the attacker control the EDX. Definitely control EDX. So this is going to be an information. What do you call that? So yeah, like information, information disclosure. Information disclosure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we probably like definitely control EAX as well. Mm -hmm. um, not real excited immediately since so it's just like a pointer dereference. You know, I'm like okay, not not too awesome. Let's see what happens. Uh, This is that same example with some extra disassembly. So definitely exploitable, right? Yeah. So um, because of this common construct, I believe Windybug says if the next line of it, um, next line of code that's going to execute right before you crash is a call, it automatically turns determines it as um, being exploitable. No, that's not always the case. This could be called you know, EBX or ECX or whatever. But since it's calling a value that we presumably control, then um, probably exploitable. It's a good thing we redacted the module name. Because uh, I believe that's a vulnerability that is not matched. Yeah. Uh, but I don't remember, actually. I don't remember what this is. Okay, how about this? What do you guys think about this one? This is another, I remember this bug. This is bug is definitely a real unpatched vulnerability. Uh, this is a, just for those of you curiously, curious, it's a remotely exploitable vulnerability in like a video game server. Mm -hmm. So like the server that you connect to that you know, play video games with people.
So one problem here is that often with crashes, you corrupt the state of the program so much that you can't really tell what the hell is going on. So like if you corrupt the stack, you feel I can't read the call stack anymore because um, the EBP and the frame pointers are corrupted. So you don't really know where you are or how you got there. What we can tell is that the EIP and ECX are the same. We suggest that it called ECX. So what do you guys think about whether or not this is exploitable? Just looking at this. Definitely interesting. So let's see what the, what's on the stack. No. Well, if you can overwrite the. I actually the, just um, I was not. Go ahead. I was going to say if you can over if you're smashing the EBP with one, right? If that was attacker controlled data, then you could theoretically do the. Uh, you know, frame pointer overwrite type thing that you did in the exploits one. Yeah, that's true, but with this bug, unfortunately I found I could only control the least significant bytes of these values because they were coming in from like single byte writes and that the rest of it was um, automatically XOR to zero. So I could only overwrite like the least significant byte of EIP and EBP, etc. And a uh, well, I, can, I should say I can only control that, and the rest was automatically zero. So I couldn't come up with a way to exploit this, but um, it's possible someone else could, you know, using some technique that I'm not aware of. So some rules here is that it's easy to determine exploitability. If EIP equals a dead beef, then you know right away. This is definitely exploitable. Um, not exploitability is harder if not impossible. Just because you can't exploit a bug doesn't mean someone can't, someone out there isn't smart enough or has some cool trick up their sleeve that allows them to exploit it. There have been a lot of bugs out there, crashes, that vendors have come out and said, this isn't, we don't think this is exploitable, this is just like a crash denial of service. And that inspired some guy out there to spend the next month of his life dedicated to um, developing an exploit for it that got arbitrary code execution. So a lot of vendors have kind of shot themselves in the foot by saying this isn't exploitable and someone comes along and invents some new technique that allows them to exploit a bug that was previously thought to be uh, not leverageable for arbitrary code execution. So exploitability, easy to determine, not exploitability, harder if not impossible. Okay, so what I want you guys to do is to look at your crashes on your own and um, try to pick one out that you think is exploitable for sure. And for those of you that want to follow along with me, if you're not feeling, uh, you know, if you don't, those of you who are brave, I should say, can use your own crashes. Um, but if you're using your own crashes, obviously what your screen will look like will end up looking different than my screen because I'll end up working from a different crash. If you want to follow along with me, if you're worried that you're going to get sidetracked or something like that, you can follow along with me directly because I have included in the virtual machine some uh, pre-generated crashes in, in the instructor stuff directory. C colon slash instructor stuff. And in here I have a bunch of uh, crash documents that I've pre-generated for you guys. But if I encourage you, if you feel confident with this, to try to use your own crashes and try to determine their exploitability. So you guys take like, um, I want you to take 15 minutes or so, go through the crashes I gave you, or the crashes you generated, and try to pick out a few that you feel pretty sure about are exploitable. Hey Corey, when you restart the fuzzer, does the crashlog.txt get regenerated as well as the crash docs folder? Yeah, they both get overwritten. So if you want to save those across restarting your fuzzer, back them up. And you have to create it. You rename the crash docs directory. You have to create a new crash docs directory. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I created right. crash docs backup, and I didn't know the crash log was getting overwritten. So I just searched through my crash log, and literally every single thing is the same crash. So they're all useless. So that's why I'm going to use yours. Mm. So look through those as instructor stuff for crash docs and try to figure out which ones you think are exploitable then. 
And I want you guys to look at that on your own for a few minutes, and I'll um, then I'll go through it and try to reason with you about these more as well. So some questions you should be asking yourself when you're looking at these is like, okay, it's a red blue SD, so it's a mem copy. That's good. Um, do I control the data? Like, where is the data being written to? Is it written to the stack or the heap? If it's a stack, that's better than the heap because the stack, stack overflows are easier to exploit than heap overflows. Do I control the source data, the data that's causing the corruption? How much data is being written there? Are the exception handlers corrupted at the time of the crash? And you can think about, how do I determine if I control that data or not? Well, um, I'll start working through some of those instructor stuff crashes so you guys can get an idea of what my methodology would be, some more for determining uh, the exploitability of crashes. So Zeno thinks that crash 9 and the instructor stuff is exploitable. And the reason he did that was um, he looked at the source data for the BIM copy and he determined the source copy was actually present in a CDF document. So let me show you what he's talking about. Okay, so I'm looking at this crash log. Rep move SD, again, we've seen this one, uninitialized data. Um, kind of, you know, unclear what's going on. Red move SD, more, more uninitialized data. Uh, we've seen this one before. Move AL, ESI. Just moving a single byte value around. Uh, not too promising. Um, FE is more uninitialized data. Don't know, not sure. Add point of view reference, probably don't care about it. Another red move SD, uninitialized data. Forget about it for now. Let's see what else we got. If I don't find anything better, I will come back to these. Because maybe I control that data, maybe I don't. But um, right now it's unclear. So I just want to see what else is out there for me. Maybe something more promising. This guy again, I've already seen it. Doesn't look good. ECX, zero, no pointer dereference. Don't care about it. Red move SD, uninitialized data again. Okay. Batch number nine. 33CC666 CC99. So that is not uninitialized data. ESI. Uh, can anyone tell me what address they think that is? Is that a stack address? So that's a heap address. Um, just good to keep track of where things are. But where is it writing to? What type of address is this writing to? Stack. Okay, so we are writing to the stack, so that's a good sign. Um, the stack is pointing at what looks like attacker controlled data, so that's also a good sign. Um, so let's go ahead and. Um, that's crush 10, actually. Crash number 10 oh, yeah, after that. That's true. So this, yeah, that's right. This is technically crash 10 because the crash number comes afterwards. Good point, and that's a little confusing. So to really get into the uh, the meat of this crash, though, what we need to do is step through the execution of the debugger, and we want to do the same kind of thing that we did yesterday, where we um, look at the state. We look at the state of the program right before the source of corruption, the uh, this this NIM copy. And right afterwards, so we have to figure out where this NIM copy is and do a break right before. So I'm going to show you guys the process of doing this. For anyone that wants to follow along, this is Crash 10 and the instructor stuff one that I'll be looking at. Sorry with that. Well, I'm just uh, getting a minute to get 
see that? Hey Corey, can you increase the size on the command window as well? I probably should have said that yesterday, but... Oh, uh, yeah. Is that any better, Zeno? It's a little better. I think one more would be better, and I know it'll wrap lines, but that's still gonna get pixelated. Uh, let me see. It might be better if I just do bold fonts. How about that? Bigger would still be better, but that's probably fine. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm going to run this, because uh, whenever you have these, when you think something is exploitable, you want to actually take the time to step through the corruption and uh, just see how the state of the program changes when you have this overflow, and that'll give you a better idea whether or not you think it's exploitable. So, to start with, let me add. I'm just going to hit G and um, let it go ahead and hit its crash. Okay, then I have an access violation of this mem copy, like just what we saw before. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at the call stack and I'm going to see where this mem copy was called from. And I'm going to, so I can discover what calls this um, vulnerable mem copy and try to break right before that. So I can uh, restart the program and stop it right before the source of corruption. That will allow me to inspect the parameters that are passed to memcopy, like the source, the destination, the size, and try to determine uh, definitively if those are things that I control. So I'm going to keep uh, walking through this a little bit. Did it, did it work? Yeah. Load of sex the web. <laughs> you might have like an exploitable bug in it. What do you put there? You should look at. Uh, that's, Actually, that should be useful for black hat. <laughs> that is like definitely not supposed to happen. I've not seen that before. So um, PowerPoint Ninja here just ran into a weird issue where it was like uh, not actually allowing the the windy bug wasn't allowing the process to continue. It's like in a, a breakpoint loop. He did a dot load msec, and then it automatically worked. And that Did should you do a bang exploitable on that. It says it's not exploitable. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> oh no, on the breakpoint loop thing. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, yeah, I know. So, I mean, you should look at that, though. You might have something good there. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm trying to figure out um, where that bad mim copy is called, and I want to break right before it's. Uh, actually executed. That way I can look at the state of the program before and after, or rather before because afterwards we'll never get there, and the parameters that are passed in mem copy. So uh, who can tell me where I should set a breakpoint on to accomplish that, looking at this output? Well, actually, I guess that um, this represents the return address. So this represents the return address for memcopy. So if we unassemble backwards from this address, we should see the call for memcopy. So if you do the UB command, it'll actually unassemble backwards, like in the opposite direction. And I'm going to do that on the return address for the uh, call to memcopy. And I can see right here <coughs> that this is the, the bad call to mem copy. All right? Everyone understand how I got that? 
And what we're going to do is we're going to relaunch the application. And we're going to set a breakpoint for on this call so we can look at the parameters that are passed to it in the state of the program and then try to make like a definitive answer whether or not we think this is exploitable and how we should exploit it. So I'm going to write down this address. Do a dot restart and set the breakpoint. Then let it run to the breakpoint. Now we know that we're at the point of no return. Once this mem copy happens, we're going to corrupt the state of the process. Bad things will happen. The program's going to crash. Um, so let's take a look and see what we see right here on the edge of oblivion. So first of all, how many arguments does min copy take? Three, right? Source, destination, and number of bytes. So let's look at the three parameters that are being passed to min copy. So out of curiosity, just looking at this output and where we're at, can anyone tell me what the fuzzer did to cause this crash? The third it's argument? Third it's argument. Really big. Size. It looks like I wrote a random byte into like a size argument for the mem copy. Okay. Now, this is the, um, the destination and this is the source. Who can tell me, besides you know, because he's already answered this, whether or not we control this data? Tell me how you derive that answer. There's a ship. HIP address? The source source address is HIP address? That's maybe, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, the source is the HIP address, but, but is it data that we control? So that is a sort of definitive way to say, do we control this data? What does the attacker control? The attacker controls the contents of the CDF file. He can forge his own malformed CDF files. So let's open this up. HXD. Look right away, I can see that the data is here. It wasn't so obvious I could just do a search in HXD for those bytes that are appearing as a source parameter for the mem copy. And so I know I have attacker controlled data overriding the stack and generating exception. So almost this is definitely exploitable. So with this process in mind, I want you guys to pick out a crash that you think is exploitable. If you want to follow along with me, you're welcome just to use crashgen.cdf. However, I encourage you to use something of your own crashes that's um, separate from this one. There are other vulnerabilities in here as well, all right, not just this one. And try to identify a vulnerable crash and then turn it into an exploit that launches calc.exe when you use CDF reader on the document. 
that to be your lap for a while here, for another hour or so. So you guys get working on that. Um, a couple things while you get started. The act this particular vulnerability here, the source is the source of the vulnerability is there is an attacker or a document specified integer, which is telling the mem copy, you know, how much the string to copy into a buffer. Um, I see that all the time in bugs that I find. In proprietary network protocols and proprietary documents like this, all the time we'll have like an integer that controls how much data is allocated or how much gets copied. And it's like, I want to say like 50% of the bugs I've found, that's been like the source. Attacker controlled integer. And I think what the developer thinks is, well, these documents or this network server is only communicated with by our proprietary, you know, document building program or our proprietary uh, network client. And so these values, they think, well, these values are just going to be standards sanity check on the client side, or sanity check at the time of generation. I mean, who would bother to go and like reverse engineer the specification, write your own protocol that could, you know, generate bogus data for those integers? Well, obviously someone that's interested in selling exploits for money will go and do that. So whenever I see an attacker-controlled integer, like a 32-bit attacker-controlled integer being used for stuff like that, I get real excited and I'm like, okay, it's game time. I bet I can do something with this. A lot of times the, uh, the program is going to use that as a source for an allocation or a copy or it's going to do some arithmetic on it. And I know that, you know, that it's a huge source of vulnerabilities, attacker supply integers being used in a target program. And these software developers just think, well, the sanity checking is going to happen at a time of document creation or it's going, you know, the client that's connecting to the server will be doing the sanity checking on the data that's sent to the server. Because only, I mean, who would bother writing their own client to talk to my server, right? Only my proprietary uh, client is going to be talking to my custom proprietary server here, right? So there's not going to be any problems. 